and good morning again, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be with you on this Sunday. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rick. I'm actually the Bishop of the Diocese of Armidale. I met some visitors this morning. I even met somebody from Malaita, where we have, a par where we have had in the past a partnership with uh, the diocese over there. Very special welcome to you and anyone else that's visiting this morning. Uh, great to have you. Please have your Bibles open with me uh, at Isaiah chapter 9 and 10 because that's what we're looking at this morning. We were looking at Isaiah 7 and 8 last week, 9 and 10 this week, 11 and 12 next week. Um, and uh, that's where we're heading. Uh, I want to say this week's the bad news and next week's the good news. Okay? Um, because today, and that's not really quite right, because both news come from God, and God doesn't give anything but excellent news. So perhaps if I put it a little differently, this week is the hard news. Next week will be the gloriously gentle news of, um, of mercy and grace, although that's not missing in today. Okay, uh, And if you think it is, then you don't understand the judgment of God because God's judgment, righteous judgment, is a mercy to everybody. All right? Let me pray and you should have your Bibles open at page 555. Our Heavenly Father, please grant to us today that we might listen to what you have to say. Please help us not to be like those that Isaiah was sent to, who though they saw, never perceived, and though they heard, they never understood. Please grant us ever-deepening perceptions in your word that we might know the truth, that we might hear it and understand it, and in, perce in perception and in understanding, may we indeed live it for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I don't know if you've got a favourite verse. Nearly everyone I meet's got a favourite verse. And uh, a common favourite verse is Exodus 34, 6. Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth. That's a good verse, isn't it? You know, we often say it, the abbreviated versions, God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Great verse. We actually sing it. Uh, it's a line in a song that we sing, at least in the evening congregation, 10,000 reasons. There are, there's more than 10,000 reasons to praise God, but that song gives us, and it does, it, I've got to say, th the song doesn't have 10,000 reasons in it. We'd be singing it forever, wouldn't we? There are hymns like that sometimes. But, um, but one of the lines is that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But what the song doesn't do and what just... Exodus 34, 6 doesn't do is it doesn't actually give you the context because in chapter 34, verse 7, it says this, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. God's slowness to anger does not mean that he can't be angered. And as we turn to Isaiah 9 and 10, we get a look this morning at God's anger. Now, I need to clarify here, God's anger, his wrath, is nothing like yours or mine. Okay? We have the capacity to kind of fall off the angry perch when a child drops a plate. Or if you hit a slice when you should have hit a hook. We, we, we are quick to respond, aren't we? Someone accidentally goes through the roundabout at a time when they shouldn't have, and we're immediately angry. God is not like that. God's anger is slow to be brought about. It's very deliberate when it comes about. It's very purposeful, and it very rightly has a cause to it. So don't misunderstand God's wrath and anger at this point by comparing it to your own. In fact, when we come to chapters 9 and 10, you'll notice that God's anger is expressed in a fourfold refrain in verse 12, verse 17, verse 21, and again in chapter 10, verse 4. It was the refrain that Chris spoke to the children about. You can see it there. In all this, his anger is not removed and his hand is still raised to strike. 
Now, God's wrath or anger is not a popular content for most people. No one likes God to be like he is here in Isaiah. But that really is not the big issue in these chapters. See, the really big issue is that God doesn't like the way people are in these chapters. And in truth, when you get a look at them, nor do we. And if God is the same yesterday, today and forever, these chapters introduce us to what God is like now and what still turns God's anger on. And as people who have known parent, a parent's anger, or worse, a spouse's anger, investigating what turns anger on and what turns it off or away is a worthy Sunday activity, especially when we are considering that we are dealing this morning with God's anger, so you're in church doing a very worthy activity. Okay? Let's take up the issue in chapter 9, verse 8, as the focus of Isaiah's message turns north and towards Assyria. Last week we were dealing with Judah, the southern end of Israel proper. In the northern end, the house of Jacob, or what became known as Israel, there are um, ten tribes there, um, and they're known as Israel in the north, and so the prophecy turns towards the north and towards the enemy that one day will come and overwhelm them. Now, I can't help but think that last week's introduction to Emmanuel, which means God with us, you remember that last week? Which, Emmanuel, which means God with us. That is great news if God is with us as one who is for us. But for Emmanuel, God with us, to be with us as someone who is against us, well, that's not so happy, is it? And that's what you have in verse 8. The Lord sent a message against Jacob. It came against Israel. And the problem is fourfold. The first problem, you'll notice, is in verses 9 and 10. And the problem is arrogance and pride. Anyone got a problem with that? Is that an issue for you? Arrogance and pride out there, in here. Anyone troubled by that? Surrounded by fallen bricks and felled fig trees or sycamores caused by their enemies, Israel may not have been able to flex their muscles sufficient to overcome their enemies, but please notice that even a weak and defeated nation like Israel can still flex their pride. You don't have to be rich, you don't have to be healthy, you don't have to be powerful to be proud, you can actually do it when you're weak and pathetic. In fact, we can all do it. Notice what they say. There is no prayer. There's no humility here in the comments that are made. There is no God, really, in their comments. Just the arrogance of a voice that declares, see it here? The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with cut stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. It's almost like, I can almost hear the old NRL theme song. You remember that one? I get knocked down, but I get up again. I get knocked down, but I get up again. It's that kind of pride. That's what we see here. You can hurt us, but we'll rise up bigger and better than we were before. <laughs> it's a familiar notion in our world, isn't it? They didn't need to rebuild, though, Israel. Please note this. They didn't need to rebuild Israel. Their most pressing need was to repent or God's anger would not turn aside which is precisely what Isaiah says in verse 12 in all this his anger is not removed and his hand is still raised to strike it's pretty obvious what turns God's anger on 
But what turns God's anger away? Well, the second problem in verses 13 to 17 is unsurprisingly bad leadership. Surrounded by their fallen brick bravado in verse 13, it highlights a problem that leadership seems unprepared to consider. Look at it there, verse 13. The people did not turn to him who struck them. They did not seek the Lord of hosts. It is true to say earthly enemies may have caused them problems. It is true to say that Assyria will come as the rod of God's judgment, but it is their ignored God who, who struck them. And no one in Israel stopped long enough to ask, could this be the judgment of God and should we repent? You know, um, there are times when God will use whatever is at his disposal to bring about his judgment. As we will see um, uh, in the text as we read on, he uses Assyria. Interestingly, Assyria has no love for God. They're completely disinterested in the purposes of God, but God uses their purposes to bring about his judgment on the nation of Israel. They're on a conquering tour, Assyria, eventually, but God actually will use them as his judgment on Israel. God can do that. It's a bit weird. Sounds a bit weird to us. But if I was to give you a contemporary kind of what it might be like, and I'm not saying that this is the case. Did you hear that? So if you're quoting me, I'm not saying that this is the case. But what you see with Assyria and Israel could, if I was to contemporise it, be like God using North Korea who has absolutely no desire to be interested in what God's about, but God uses North Korea to actually bring his judgment on the West. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. I'm not saying that that's actually what God's doing. Um, Only time would tell us if that was what God was going to do, Um, and I have no idea if that's what he's going to do, but that's what he does with Assyria. And the problem here is not the enemies, but the ignored God who would strike them in judgment. And no one asks the question, could this be the judgment of God on us, what's happening to us, and should we repent? It might be strange to us to think, uh, to ask such a question when calamity comes upon us. But Israel had lived a long enough history to know that God can and will use whatever means he chooses to punish wrongdoing and save a repentant people. Now, I want to say that again because the next sentence is crucial. Okay? So switch on. God can and will use whatever means he chooses to punish wrongdoing and save a repentant people. He can do whatever he chooses. And if you don't get this, then I want to suggest to you, you will struggle to understand the cross of Christ. God can choose whatever method he wants to bring about punishment on sin and save a repentant people. You don't get that, you won't get the cross. I don't expect an unbelieving person to really understand all of this this morning, and you may struggle with it, and if you are an unbeliever in church this morning, welcome, it's great that you're here, it's good that you're inquisitive, please come and talk and ask lots of questions of myself or of the dean or any of the ministry team here. But to a Christian... We often recognise the hand of God in things that happen to us, don't we? Things that teach us, in the end, to rely on God that force us to repent of relying upon ourselves. We know that experience, don't we? C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone 
to rouse a deaf world. Well, in their moment of decision, it seems Israel's leadership offered, instead of repentance, optimistic rebuilding messages. The people applauded them, the leaders delighted in the adulation, and to keep the adulation, they governed according to the polling and not according to the truth. Let the listener understand. And when divine accountability is gone and truth suffers at the hand of personality politics, it is not surprising in verse 14 and 15 that we read, the Lord cut off Israel's head and tail, palm branch and reed in a single day. The head is the elder, the dignitary. The tail is the prophet, the lying teacher. The leaders of the people misled them And those they misled are swallowed up. And when leadership is lacking, divine accountability is ignored, and truth is the casualty, it's hardly surprising to read in verse 17 that from the youth up, everyone becomes a godless evildoer with mouths that speak folly, a people who have no moral principle. And nor is the refrain surprising in verse 17. In all this, his anger is not removed and his hand is still raised to strike. What turns God's anger on is pretty obvious. But what turns God's anger away? Well, the third problem is in verses 19 to 21, and it's one of civil strife. Arrogant, poorly led, morally bereft, we read in verse 18, for the wickedness, for wickedness burns like a fire that consumes thorns and briars and kindles the forest thickets so that they go up in a column of smoke. The land is scorched by the wrath of the Lord of hosts and the people are like fuel for the fire. No one has compassion on his brother. Terrible picture, really. It's really... Uh, uh, as I, as I read, a picture of God, in a sense, handing people over to themselves. He does that, interestingly, in Romans 1, which I'd encourage you to read because I think it's a very appropriate part of the scriptures for where we live today, our current context, Romans 1. But we know that through the Bible, sometimes God in his judgment will choose in his judgment, as a judgment, to hand people over To themselves. Notice what he does here. For wickedness burns like a fire that consumes thorns and briars and kindles the forest thickets so that they go up in a column of smoke. The land is scorched by the wrath of the Lord of hosts. He's handed Israel over to their own wickedness. Not only is Israel in the end threatened externally by enemies, Their sin here in this passage is causing them to self-destruct internally as faithlessness and godlessness reap their own destruction. And in verse 21, we read, In all this, his hand is not removed, and 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 his hand is still raised to strike. And again, it's obvious what turns God's anger on, but what will turn it away? Well, there is much for us to learn and much to disquiet us as we come to chapter 10, verse 1, where the fourth problem seems to be oppression. When the elites, in their arrogance, express themselves in bad leadership and a a nation's moral fabric self-destructs, it's not long before a form of oppression or an oppressor will fill the vacuum. And with such oppression, in verse 2, comes oppressive laws, lack of fair trial, deprivation of justice, sinking ultimately to the oppressions, to oppression's unhindered abuse of vulnerable, like widows and children. Uh, there are so many things that I wish I had the freedom to say at this point, but so many things that you would misunderstand if I said them. So I hope you would do some private applicational thinking on this.
I'm a little grieved by this part of Isaiah, I have to tell you. 740 BC makes this prophecy a very ancient text, doesn't it? But it feels so applicationally contemporary. This ancient text could be a modern description of our own nation's arrogance, failures of leadership and leadership by poll. It could be such a very clear description in so many ways of a decaying society and maybe just presenting amongst the elites a warning for our future. We know what turns God's anger on, but the question is really one for us today. What will turn God's anger away? We may have issues with God's anger, but the real issue is God's anger with us. And when you see why, as you look at those four problems, it's really hard to argue against God's anger. And when God uses an unwitting and wicked nation like Assyria to be the rod of his anger in chapter 10, verse 5, the what, when, who, where questions of verse 3 carry enormous importance. He says in verse 3, I think your translation might be a little different, but it says, what will you do on the day of punishment? When devastation comes from far away, who will you run to for help? Where will you leave your wealth? There will be nothing to do except crouch among the prisoners or fall among the slain. We know, friends, that sin turns on God's anger. But I want to suggest to you this morning that the only thing that will turn God's anger off is judgment, righteous judgment. That might surprise you that I've just said that. It may seem grossly unfair that God would use the unwitting wickedness of Assyria to punish Israel here in Isaiah 10, but you and I this very day know something much more unfair when it comes to God's judgment upon our world, don't we? Don't we? You're not sure what I'm about to say, are you? It's one of those things, I'm not answering this question because I'm sure I'm going to get it wrong. But on the background of judgment, what's most unfair is grace. The undeserved free gift of God turning away his wrath from you and from me. That is unfair. That is us getting what we don't deserve. The New Testament uses a term, um, you might write it down if you're taking notes, it's the term propitiation. And he uses this term to describe this act of God's grace towards us. It's a big word that simply means God's judgment has propitiated his anger or wrath. It's turned it aside. It's turned it away. God's anger is satisfied. And the agent of such grace is, of course, Jesus Christ who is the promised shoot from the stump of Jesse here in chapter Isaiah 11, verse 1, which we'll come to next week. But to be the agent of such grace, Jesus has to become the object of God's wrath. Hear that? In a moment, you're going to take the Lord's Supper. And as you come and take the Lord's Supper, every thought that overwhelms you as you take and eat and drink is a remembrance that for us to receive grace the agent of that grace be the agent of that grace sorry but to be the recipient of such grace 
It has come because the object of God's wrath has been Jesus. Isaiah puts it very well later on in his book, in chapter 53, you know it well. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Ba, um, ba, 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 do, ba, or whatever it was, all right? You know Colin's song, don't you? Well, Colin wasn't the first to write this verse. It actually was Isaiah. And it says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has what? Laid on him the iniquity of us all, or perhaps another translation, and the Lord has punished him, that is Jesus, for the iniquity of us all. God turns away his anger in judgment, a judgment that falls on his son, and mercy is delivered to us. Sin insists upon being attended to. A righteous God must attend to sin. And while God whispers to us in our pleasures, he shouts at us today in Jesus' pains and sufferings. Jesus is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Under God's judgment, a remnant of Israel in verse 20 here of chapter 10 learnt the only right response was repentance. A return to faithful dependence on the God who is greater than any one nation and a multiple of them all. And that is just as true for now as it ever was under God's judgment, the cross on which the Saviour died urges a return to faithful dependence on our God. Repent. We know what turns God's anger on and there is nothing more desperate than knowing that it is Jesus Christ who turns God's anger away. The alternative to Jesus is a very, very just refrain. In all this, his anger is not removed and his hand is still raised to strike. I'd encourage us all to be quick to repent and put Jesus at the centre of life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.